So far this week in these lecture videos, we've talked about discrete choice models. We've talked about the random utility model to, to solve a discrete choice model, and then uh, the choice probabilities that come out of a random utility model. And then in this video, we're going to take a bit of a diversion and talk about linear probability models. But let's start by, by, by defining a binary choice. So these discrete choice problems are greatly simplified when you only have two alternatives. When you only have two alternatives, there's essentially only one kind of comparison implicit to the model. You've got alternative one or alternative two, well, then you only have to compare one versus two. Whereas when you have more than two alternatives, you kind of have multiple comparisons floating around. And so it turns out that a, the choice probabilities can be fully described with only one equation, right? For example, we could write the choice probability for alternative one, let's just, let's be a little more careful here. The choice probability, capital P, that decision maker N chooses alternative one is going to be the probability that this difference between the unobserved but random error terms, uh, utility terms, is less than the representative utility. And if our choice set is mutually exclusive and exhaustive, which it has to be, then it just must be the case that, that the choice probability for alternative two is just one minus the choice probability of one. So once we define one, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd kind of get, get to for free, basically. All right, we also said in the last set of, uh, or in previous slides here, that uh, we're going to typically assume that representative utility is linear. So let's go ahead and do that and, and say that, that the utility from V uh, sub Ni is just beta times uh, the, you know, a vector of parameters beta times the vector of data x. So what we can end up with here, we just plug that in for both of our V terms here, and we can get that the choice probability for alternative one is the probability that the, uh, this random variable, the difference between epsilons is less than this linear function of our data. All right, now let's, let's pause here for a second and suppose that all we know is OLS. That might be, the world you're in right now is all you know is OLS. You're here because you want to learn some new estimation methods. If all we know is OLS, is there any way that we can estimate these parameters, the betas here? Well, remember I said this in the last set of videos. What what this choice probability is? It's it's the uh, probability that some random variable here on the left hand side is less than some. Uh, you know, if we suppose that we know beta and we know all the data, then, then it's the probability that some random variable is less than some number, which is a cumulative distribution of the random variable. Well, cumulative distributions are, are typically nonlinear, maybe always nonlinear. Um, and so now our choice probability is, right, it might, it might look linear at first because we've got this linear function on the right hand side, but ultimately our outcome choice probability is, is this kind of highly nonlinear uh, function of our parameters and our data. If it's a highly nonlinear function, we use, then we can't use, uh, then we can't use OLS. OLS only works in kind of a, a setting where, where we're linear in parameters. So let's abstract away from our structural model for a moment and think about a non-structural approach. We're gonna to return to structure and structural estimation next week, but just for the rest of this lecture, let's think about if we know OLS, how close can we get to actually estimating this thing? So I just said from the structural model, these choice probabilities, uh, the choice probability of one, for example, is a non-linear function about the data. But we could think about writing down a simple linear analog that is a linear function instead of a nonlinear function. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that choice probability where we said, okay, we know this choice probability is a function of some parameters, some data, some random variables. Um, it's nonlinear. Let's just make it linear instead. Let's just consider the linear analog that has all the same pieces, some parameters times some data, and then some uh, uh, error terms that are important, but let's just make it linear. 
So let's write that down here. We're just going to say that on the left hand side, we have a binary variable of one zero that's going to equal one if and only if uh, decision maker n chooses alternative one and then it equals zero if they choose two instead. And that's going to be a, a linear function of some parameters and data plus an error term. Well, if we make standard OLS assumptions about this, in particular about the error term, then what we're going to get here is that the conditional probability that y equals one is the conditional expectation of y, and the conditional expectation function is this uh, linear, uh, linear function of parameters and data. So ultimately what we've got here is we've got something like a choice probability, the probability that a decision maker chooses something as a function of data is a linear function. So what we've created here is this OLS regression model that we usually call the linear probability model. I just want to highlight here, it is not the same model that's going to estimate those same parameters that we had here. This is a highly nonlinear function, uh, but what we can do is we can use that to inform instead a linear approach. Once again, we're just trying to set up something here where we can use what we know about OLS and try to get as close as possible to estimating one of these uh, binary choice problems. So let's look at an example from the last, last uh, video. We had this example or our previous video. A person is choosing whether to take a car or a bus to work and we observe the time T and the cost M of each choice. So when we looked at this example before, we wrote down the choice probability of driving. The probability of taking the car is the probability that the difference in error terms or uh, random unobserved utility is less than this, this linear function of parameters and data. But once again, this is all, the right hand side looks linear, but it's inside this cumulative distribution function. And so this choice probability itself is very nonlinear. But we can write down this kind of linear analog and use an OLS to estimate it. So we can take all the pieces from this. We can take the fact that we've got an error term, we've got some parameters, we've, and we've got a linear function of parameters and data, let's say, and write down the kind of OLS analog here. So we're going to have a 1, 0 on the left-hand side that equals an intercept term plus you know, a, a coefficient times the time of driving plus a coefficient times the time of taking the bus plus another coefficient times the cost of driving plus another coefficient times the cost of taking the bus plus, uh, plus an error term. This is just a simple OLS regression that you're going to be able to estimate with what you learned uh, previously in OLS uh, classes. So what are the pros and cons of this approach, right? I said we're kind of deviating from structure for, for just the, the rest of this lecture. Let's talk about the pros and cons of actually deviating from, from, from our structural model. Well, we started from this nonlinear model of choice probabilities. We converted that to this linear model, linear probability model. The pros of that is that we can estimate this linear probability model using OLS. So it's a fast and easy regression with assumptions that are transparent and well known as opposed to, uh, you know, kind of the pedagogical point of this is to show you that you might not have the knowledge yet to even know how to estimate one of these nonlinear choice probabilities. But once we turn that into a linear analog, you can just use OLS. Uh, another pro, depending on what, what coefficients you want to estimate, is these coefficients can be interpreted as marginal effects. What is the marginal effect of changing some data on the probability of actually choosing one versus two? So th that could be exactly what you want to estimate. And if so, then this is a great, a great tool to estimate it. What are some of the cons though, right? We've, we've deviated from our structural model. What do, what do we lose when we do that? Well, one of the big cons of a linear probability model is that probabilities are not bounded by zero or one. Uh, we've, things are totally linear. If you just happen to have data that's way kind of, out, you know, outlier data, it's possible that our model could tell you that you have a probability less than zero or a probability of greater than 100% of choosing something, which seems uh, uh, maybe not ideal depending on exactly what we're doing. 
One possible outcome of that is that if you have a lot of observations that end up far outside that zero one range, uh, then your coefficients can actually be biased and inconsistent. I've never really, I've personally never been in a situation where I've run a linear probability model and ended up with lots of observations outside of the zero one range. So this has never been a, a, a big concern of mine, but it is theoretically possible and depending on your setting could be something that could, could pop up. Um, the other big con here is that our coefficients aren't actually structural parameters, right? We talked about this before, especially with, with linear utility, like we've set up here, our marginal, uh, uh, the structural parameters here is marginal utility. But when we deviate from our structure and estimate just a simple OLS model, we're getting marginal effects instead of marginal utility. Just to, to kind of highlight what I mean by that, what we wanted to get out of our structural model is if you change a variable a little bit, money, let's say, how does utility change? That's going to tell us what a decision maker's marginal utility is. Instead, what we're going to get out of the OLS linear probability model is if you change the cost of an alternative by a little bit, how does the ultimate decision change? So we're kind of skipping over that, that, that middle step of calculating utility. And so we don't actually get marginal utility. We get total marginal effect instead. And so if what you're wanting is marginal utility, then using a linear, linear probability model, you've kind of just assumed utility away and skipped it. And so that's clearly not ideal if marginal utility is what you were after. Um, then the third problem here is that error terms are heteroscedastic and not normally distributed. Uh, so we're going to have to do some extra things to maybe clean up our regression if we're worried about those issues. Um, of course, whether the pros outweigh the cons, it's going to depend on your context, your research question, your data, all of that. So we can do that if we have a binary choice, right? I set that up as let's start with the simple binary choice. Now let's think about a mul multinomial choice instead. Multinomial choice is when we have more than two alternatives. Well, remember I said we can use OLS to non-structurally estimate a linear probability model of a binary choice because it's implicitly just kind of one comparison that we can represent with just one equation. It may or may not be the best method, but it is feasible and it does have some advantages. So it is something we can do. But once we move to multinomial choice, where, we're, where we have more than two alternatives, can you think of any kind of an OLS or other non-structural approach to estimate all, to kind of jointly estimate all of those different comparisons that are implicit, right? At the beginning of this, this week's lectures, I used an example of a discrete choice of how people get to campus and laid out like eight possible alternatives. And so when you have eight possible alternatives, you need to make, you, you're essentially making, thinking about the every single possible pairwise combination of those eight alternatives, um, which gets really tricky, right? Uh, to, to understand, at the very least, to, to know which one is the, the, the most, you need to compare it to everything else to see which is which has the most utility. Uh, so you've got kind of a lot of different utility comparisons implicit in, in a multinomial choice. And so I at least can't think of a really great kind of robust way to use OLS or some other non-structural uh, approach to kind of jointly take all of those different comparisons in, in, into account and, and, and estimate things in a way that, that, is, that, that just relies on maybe the knowledge of OLS or something like that. So what we're seeing here is that as we move to these more complicated choice settings, really a structural approach is going to become the most feasible and maybe only feasible way to credibly estimate a model of discrete choice. So just to reiterate, when you've got two alternatives, you can use the linear probability model to non-structurally estimate an analog, but not actually estimate your structural model. But when we get to multinomial choice, there's just really no way to do this that, that avoids um, the kind of structural modeling and estimation that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the semester. So uh, that's all I have for the kind of the theory side of things. In class this week, we're going to talk about, uh, or, or you can see it here in, in the, the slides, we're going to have uh, uh, examples using R, uh, actually estimating a linear probability model, which um, 
uh, I hope we'll, we'll both reinforce some, uh, some knowledge about linear probability models and also just give us a good excuse to, to play around in R a little bit more before we start doing the real structural estimation stuff.